again to the words of this song as we go into the message.
149. Hallelujah. <laughs> let them sing. Let them praise His name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto Him with the temporal and the heart. For the Lord taketh pleasure in His people, and He will beautify the meek with salvation. Now here's what the Word of God said. David speaking, One thing have I desire, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. To behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in His temple. Let's look at the definition of beauty. Remember, He's going to beautify the meek with salvation. Beauty is the quality. Now the Word of God is full of this word, beauty. Now we're going to find that Satan tries to distill it, the beauty of God. And it's it's distorted a lot. People are distorting it today. But there's a beauty in God's Word that we're going to dig down deep today and find. The quality of something that gives pleasure to the senses or pleasurably exalts the mind or spirit. Just keep it there for a moment because we're going to differentiate today between the mind and the spirit. It brings pleasure. So we want to see the difference in the beauty that brings pleasure to the flesh and the mind and the beauty that brings pleasure to the soul and the spirit, you see. So, and we know we're all natural and we all enjoy looking at beautiful things. We like to see beautiful things. We like to behold beautiful things and, and it's the quality of something that gives pleasure to the senses and we all create it with natural senses and we, we like to look at beautiful things. But what we want to look at through the course of this series of messages that we're going to be preaching on today and throughout the series of this message, how does God perceive beauty? How does God look at beauty? Does God look at beauty the same way we look at beauty? Because we look at beauty, and again we use the natural senses, and we use our sight to, to behold something that is beautiful. But God doesn't perceive beauty. He said He will beautify the meek with salvation. Now, in the time that we're living in, you know, people dike out and dress up and put on all kind of makeup, do all to beautify themselves. You see, because in the world's view and the world's perspective of beauty, that is beauty. Well, in the world's perspective of beauty, we have what you call the example. We have examples. They call models. You know what I'm talking about? They're called models. And that is the world's example of what beauty should be. Tall and thin and slim and beautiful and you just want to look at them because they're so beautiful. That is the world's perspective of beauty. And, you know, again, we're looking at beauty and something that gives pleasure to the senses and pleasurably exalts the mind of the spirit. You see? So when we get into that category, you've got to be careful that you don't get into the lust of the flesh. You see? You get into the lust of the flesh and you want to behold that kind of beauty. But when God looks at beauty and the way that we should perceive beauty is not through the natural senses, but it's through the spiritual senses. That's why the Word of God says, One thing have I desired, and this will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. The world does not behold beauty in the house of God. 
They do not look at beauty as something that's come in the church and hearing the Word of God. They do not perceive that as being something beautiful. But we do. As Christians, we see the Word of God as being something beautiful. Why? Because it goes beyond the natural and it goes into the inner man. You see? Because what does God look unto? God doesn't look unto the proud and the one that decks himself out. In fact, the Word of God says, what did you come to see? Did you come to see someone decked out in king's apparel and so forth and so on? John the Baptist did not portray himself like that. He had on camel's hair and he was eating locusts and wild honey and he wasn't much to look at. But yet, that was beautiful in the eyes of God. You see? So we need to look at today when we perceive beauty, we all going to deal with the flesh. Our flesh would much rather be somewhere else today, right? Not me, Brother Ralph. Well, your spirit wants to be here. Your flesh doesn't. If it does, something's wrong. Because your flesh is an enemy of God. So if your flesh wants to be in a place then, then, you know, it could be contrary to the Spirit of God. Because we have to bring our flesh under subjection to what? We have to bring our, we have to bring our flesh under subjection to the Spirit of God. You see? Because the flesh is always wanting to... And again, you know, if you're wanting to be real today, if you really want to be real today, you would better, instead of here fighting the devil and, 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 and worshiping God and praising God, your flesh would much rather be somewhere else where it's being entertained, where it's looking at something. Your flesh would much rather be in Hawaii somewhere. Your flesh would much rather be out in that swamp looking at the beautiful swamp. Or your flesh would much rather be in the mountains of Tennessee today than being here and hearing the Word of God and fighting the devil. Why? Because that appeals to the natural man. And we all have that. Don't act like you don't. Don't act like you don't because you do. We can act so super spiritual, but if you're spiritual, it's because you got the natural man under subjection. And let me tell you, it's going to always be rising its ugly head. You're not going to subdue it one time. Paul said, I fight daily. I crucify this old flesh. It's a daily process that I crucify this old flesh. I bring it under subjection to the Spirit of God daily. So we're seeking to behold the beauty of God. There is beauty in worship. If you can only find that place, there's beauty in prayer. But you're not going to find those things in shallow. You're going to have to dig deep to discover those things. I'm going to get ahead of myself, but I want to go to Job. Because I don't know where I'm going to I tell you what, I got these notes, I put them up up here because I don't know where I'm going to go. I say, live may not have them down, but I'm, I'm trimming my beard, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and all i got to quit and go write another note. God gave me something else. So, I'm just wanting to follow the leading of the Spirit today yeah. and see what the Spirit has to say. He discovered deep things out of darkness and bring it out to light even the shadow of death now what does that mean brother Al he discovered deep things out of darkness it's when we're in the valley that we're going to really behold the beauty of the Lord it's when we're really going through a dark trial that our trials are going to come forth and we're going to come forth as precious gold. You see? <clears throat> and it's in those deep, it's in those deep places. It's something you've got to dig for. Prayer is not something that comes easy. How many knows that today? 
especially in this last day that we're living in. There was a time I could pray so much easier than I can pray now. You hear me say this all the time. There would be a time I'd just start walking up the level and meditating and praying on God, getting lost in the presence of God. It's hard to do that now. Why? Because Satan has come down with such great wrath. And all we can see is the ugliness of the world. All we can see is the ugliness of the things around us. But I'm going to tell you, you may have to come to the house of God to behold the beauty. You may have to fall on your knees and bring this old flesh under subjection to behold the beauty. Because you're not going to find much beauty in the world. And I'm not. I'm, 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 we're in the spiritual world right now. We're not talking about the mountains of Tennessee. We're not talking about Hawaii. But let me tell you, you can go to Hawaii and have a, your mind can be so filled with ugly things. Your mind can be so filled with ugly thoughts that you can't even enjoy Hawaii. You could have $10 million in the bank and still your mind filled with ugly things. Your mind filled with depression. And your mind just, just constantly concentrating on, on things of things going wrong in your life. But we got and, and here it goes as it goes as far as to say we're gonna see the beauty even in death. We're gonna see the beauty. What does it say? He discovered deep things out of darkness. It, it's in those dark places that, that we're going to behold the beauty of God. Because it's in trials. Let me tell you, it was when my home burned down. The ugliness of a home burning down. The furnace, I mean it was like a furnace. What can you ever see beautiful in that? I saw the beautiful protection of God over my children. I saw the beautiful protection. Uh, I mean, we could ask Sister Ruth in him, what, be what, what beauty did you see out of that wreck y'all got in? You saw the beauty of God's keeping power. That, that He keeps you. What was beautiful about the furnace and the three Hebrew children were cast in? What was beautiful about that? The beauty was there was something deeper than the furnace. They didn't even have the smell of smoke on them when they went out of the furnace. They didn't even have the smell of smoke upon them. You tell me, that is beautiful. Yeah. You see? Because it's something, it is something that is deep. And the deep is calling unto the deep. Because I'm going to tell you, you're gonna, if you're not careful, all you're going to see is the ugliness of the world. Somebody called me this week. They're in a state of depression. They're in a state of depression. And I said, well, really, my answer to you is come to the house of God and hear the Word of God. I have no magic wand. Several people have been calling me. But it's like they want me to wave a magic wand and, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden they behold the beauty in the midst of the ugliness that they're in. But I'm going to tell you, we're living in an ugly world. Right. The government is not going to get any better. Right. You can look for the government to get better. You can say, well, we can elect this president. The Bible says evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse until the Antichrist himself arises. It's not going to get any better. And if you're wanting to see any beauty, it's not going to be in the things of the world. Paul said, if I had hope in this world only in Christ, I'd be of all men most miserable. Right. Folks, if you're going to see beauty, now listen, listen to that scripture. Paul said, if I had hope only, if I had hope only, in this world, in Christ, I'd be of all men most miserable. Even a Christian is talking about. And if my hope is in this world, and if the beauty that I see, I'm looking to see the beauty of this world, I'm going to tell you what, spiritually speaking, again, we're spiritually speaking, I'm not talking about the mountains of Tennessee, I'm not talking about Hawaii, but I'm talking about spiritually speaking, because we're in a spirit, we live in a natural world, but we live in a spiritual world as well. Those images that you got in your mind, 
You can have some natural images in your mind. But I'm going to tell you what. There's some warfare. There's some images that's going on. and There's some pictures that's going on in your mind. And those pictures that's going on in your mind is bringing people down. And it's bringing them down into states of depression where they got to get a pill to go to bed. they got to get a pill to wake up. they got to get pills to carry them through the day. And we're living in a pill world. And it's not just teenagers. It, 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 it goes from young until the oldest. It doesn't stop. But you know what? We're going to have to learn. What, what, what David learned the secret. One thing have I desired. And this will I seek after. Seek after. <laughs> I don't want to seek after it. Just give me a pill. Let me tell you, your best pill is on your knees. Amen. Your best pill is walking through those doors. I can, they, they, they don't want me to say that. They don't want me to say that. Again, they want me to wave. I'm not, I can't wave a magic wand and have all their problems disappear and then all the ugliness disappear and all of a sudden they see beauty. I can show them beauty in the house of God. But you see, the beauty that I will show them is not really what a lot of them want to see. They want God just to fix up their lives, but they don't want to commit to God. They want God to straighten out their lives, but they don't want to make any kind of commitment to God. But it doesn't work that way, folks. If you're going to see the beauty of the Lord. Let's look at this is the scripture I really want to go to. Titus 2. Keep that in mind. He discovereth the deep things in darkness. And we're, going, we, we, we're resorting back to that scripture. But it's, a, it's in those deep things. What are those deep things? The darkness, those, those places will call you into prayer. In those dark places, you'll realize you can't make it by yourself. And then, I, I'm going to go back to the Scripture and we, we're going to even go into how we can see beauty and death. And you might say, I don't know how in the world you're going to get that. Well, I'll show you through the Word of God. Not my opinion, but I'll show you that there is a beauty even in death. The world cannot understand it. The world cannot even grasp it. But we're going to find it in God's Word. Titus, for the grace of God. Let me tell you, that word grace is thrown around, easily thrown around. Bless God, the grace of God was with you. The grace of God was with you. The grace of God was with you. But you can't just have the grace of God with you. You've got to have the grace of God in you. Yes. For the grace of God which brings us salvation hath appeared. Because let me tell you something about the grace of God. It will appear to everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. The grace of God will appear. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. It will appear to everybody. But just because it appears to everybody, it's not going to do you any good. Listen to it. For the grace of God which brings us salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us. The grace of God is not just meant to make an appearance. The grace of God is meant to come inside of us and live inside of us and do what? Teach us. So that if you're not being taught by the grace of God, if you don't get the grace of God inside of you, then you can't be taught by the grace of God. Because you've got to have God where? In your heart. You can't just have God in the mind. You can't have God just appear to you because He will appear to all men. But what you got to do, that's what He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. What does that mean? I'm appearing to you. I'm presenting myself to you. But He said, If any man will open up 
What do you have to do? You have to open up. And he said, if you'll open up, then I'll come in and sup with you and you with me. In other words, when you open up, the grace of God will come inside of you. And from that day forward, the grace of God inside of you will teach you. You see? It's not good enough just to have the grace of God appear unto you. You got to get... What is grace anyway? We can use it as an acronym. God's riches at Christ's expense. What Jesus did at Calvary. But if you don't get it inside, if you don't get Him inside of you, then He can't teach you the way that He wants to teach you. So, so what does it teach us? And we're going to slowly get into some of these things here. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live righteously and, so, righteously and godly, soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. So again, that word grace is just thrown out there. The grace of God. The grace of God. But the grace of God, again, is not just made for an appearance. The grace of God is something that is meant to be inside of us and it teaches us. There's lessons that needs to be learned through the grace of God. Okay? You know, everybody knows a young man ran into the church. You know, heard that they were racing. Ran into the church. You know, did a lot, a lot of damage. And it, by all rights, he could have hit the telephone pole. He could have been killed. And, and the, he could have flipped over. He went over heels like, and he could have flipped over. He, let me tell you what. The grace of God appeared unto him. Yes. Now, it's whatever he does with it. You see? Because I can't make him accept it. The grace of God, and we all have experienced, all of us have experienced the grace of God in our life. Because I'm telling you, again, I told everyone that approached, the most important thing is the young boy didn't get killed. The young, everyone that would come by there, I would say, naturally, frustrated, aggravated. How many of you get frustrated, aggravated, your kids do something they shouldn't do? You get frustrated and aggravated, oh, but you still love them. Nothing's going to stop that love and you have their best interests in mind. Should there be consequences? Yes, there should be consequences involved. Because you never learn a lesson unless there's consequences involved. It's like one of your children do something wrong. You don't pat them on the back and say, well, honey, it's all right. No, you chastise them. You give them the punishment that they need so next time they won't do that. And if they were racing, they need enough chastisement so next time they know, hey, I don't want to endanger my life and endanger somebody else's life. There has to be consequences involved. But the most important thing is that soul. Amen. And let me tell you something about God. His grace appeared. But you know what? God can't make anybody accept it. He appears. I've known those that by rights they took pills and they should have been dead. They took overdoses and they should have been dead. But the grace of God appeared. And it seems like the grace of God appeared again. And the grace of God appeared again. But you know what's going to happen one day if they don't accept it and open up their hearts and let grace in? Because what does grace do? Grace teaches us. Grace doesn't just appear to make us feel good. Grace doesn't, doesn't just appear again. I want you to get this. Grace doesn't just make an appearance in our life to show us something beautiful and disappear. No. Grace reveals itself to us so that He can come in. That grace can come in and live within us and it can teach us. It can teach us a valuable lesson that we need to learn. 
How many of you are still learning? Amen. We're still learning. Because we'll talk about later on. Grace appears for salvation. And grace appears for sanctification. To continual cleansing. So grace appears for... And great grace, grace comes for two different reasons. It comes to bring salvation. What does the Bible say? The grace of God which does what? Bring salvation. That's the sole purpose of what grace is all about. The grace of God is first of all to bring salvation. And that's what God seeks after. He wants our souls. And He wants to bring salvation. So He presents His love. He presents His mercy. He presents His grace to us and causes it to appear so that we will open up our door and let salvation come in. Because let me tell you, if you don't get salvation in, there's going to come a time He's going to split through those clouds of glory. And you're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. Right. And if you haven't opened up your heart's door, for the grace of God which bringeth what? And if you haven't received salvation, where are you going to go? So what would be the purpose of grace just to appear today and appear again tomorrow and appear again next week and appear and He keeps making His appearance but you never let Him in your house? What if somebody kept coming to your house and they had a million dollar check they wanted to give you and they kept knocking on your door? Now they got a million dollar check they want to give you. And you hear the knock on your door, but I'm not going to answer that. I'm not going to answer that. And they keep knocking. And they keep coming back and making their appearance again. And they keep making their appearance. And they bring in something with them when they come. Let me tell you, when grace comes, it brings something with it. And it's not necessarily just a goosebumps and good feeling. When the grace of God comes, first of all, it's going to bring salvation. Amen. And it will also bring sanctification. We'll talk about that later. First of all, you can't be sanctified until you get saved. So first of all, grace brings salvation. So somebody would keep and using natural things to try to get a spiritual message over to you. He keeps knocking on your door. And you don't answer the door. I mean, it's waiting out there for you. All the benefits of what that, that money could bring you. All the benefits of what that money could bring you. It's just outside of your door. And it's knocking. And it wants to present it unto you. It wants to come in. And it wants to give it to you. You see? He wants to give it to you. But you don't open the door. And that's how it is with a lot of people. <clears throat> Grace keeps knocking on the door. And He keeps knocking on the door. And He keeps knocking on the door. But you know there's going to come a time when He splits through those clouds of glory. There will be no more grace. It will be only judgment. Y'all hear what I'm saying? There's going to come a time. I'm, I'm having all kind of people call me. God's dealing people. I've never seen God deal with people like He's dealing with people now. I'm having more phone calls now than I've ever had. People, God dealing with people, but where are they that I hear this morning? Because the devil's keeping them out. I mean, grace is knocking on their door, but they're not coming. The devil's trying to keep them away. But there's going to come a time that grace is no longer going to appear. It's only going to be judgment. When we stand before the great white throne of what? Judgment. There will be no grace issued out. Grace will be forever gone. We're living in what we call the dispensation of grace. God's mercy at Christ's expense. What Jesus did at Calvary is presented to everybody. People are choosing the lifestyle that they're living. The devil tell them they can't be free. And they'd rather believe the words of the devil than believe the word that you can be free. 
I do understand what I'm saying. They're addicted to drugs. We got multitudes of thousands of them that's addicted. And the devil's telling them they cannot be free. But the Bible says, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. But they would rather believe what the devil says to them. But if they would only open up, he's knocking on the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how, how low you are, if any man will open up, I will come in. Oh, and when he comes in, he can, he can show us beauty in this ugly world. And listen to me again, folks. If you're waiting on something beautiful to happen in your life, if you're waiting for some, the ugliness just to roll back, There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more heartache. That's in the, that's in the afterlife in heaven. We'll read that in Revelation. We'll talk about, that's why I'm talking about the beauty of death. You can see the beauty of death. I don't see anything beautiful about death. Well, I mean, if you read in Revelation, there's streets of gold and walls of jasper. No more tears, no more heart. Uh, that's something beautiful to me. That's something more beautiful than you. some people. You understand that some people wake up with pain every day of their life? You realize that some people go to bed with pain every day of their life? You realize that there's those that are shedding tears every day of their life through family problems and situations. They're shedding tears every day of their life. But the Bible says... God will wipe away all the tears. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more. All these former things are passed away. So we're living in an ugly world. You know, there's, a, there's this group called the Jehovah Witness. And what they believe that the world is going to gradually get better and better and better. And it's going to be peace on earth. And, and you know, that's what they believe. But somehow it's going opposite of what they believe. It's going downhill, right? I don't see it going up. I see it spiraling down, down, down. How many know there's more sickness now than there ever was? How many know there's more heartache now than there ever was? There's more diseases now than there... When I was growing up as a young boy, I just don't remember all that stuff. Sure, there were some sicknesses, there were colds, and, and there were certain things, but I just don't remember so much cancer and so much heart attacks. and I just don't remember all that stuff as much as it prevails today. So it's, there's more pestilence, more diseases. There's the West Nile. Now, there was no such thing as that. There's all kind of things now that used to not be. You got to take shots to prevent this, shot to prevent that, shot to prevent, you know, all kind of shots to prevent all these things that's in the world today. So if I had hope in this world only in Christ, I'd be of all men most miserable. My hope has to extend. If I'm going to see beauty, I'm going to see it. I saw Brother Charlie the other night slayed out in the Spirit. He was beholding the beauty of God. Amen. I saw others dancing and worshiping and glorifying. They were beholding the beauty of God. But I want to talk to you, and we're going to get into a lot of areas. But I'm going to show you how that the beauty of God. I, 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 I brought these two things. I didn't know I'd get to this today. And may touch on it. But I brought these two pieces of... Uh, these dishes and both of them are something that you cook in something that you drink out of and this is this is something that even goes beyond that because that's just made to drink out of it's not meant to be heated up a whole lot but this here can be put in the oven and it can withstand heat you know why? Because it's already been fired. It's been through the fire. Yes. And, and, and what we're going to get into, and I'm not going to get into that today, but you, you've got to realize, we're going to be getting into, see, it's not these pretty flowers that makes it useful. It's not the pretty white color that makes it useful, but it's what it's been through. Yes. It's what it's, what it's been through. 
And, and we're, we're going to talk about this. That, you know, we may have to go through the furnace of affliction. But when we come out, we'll be more beneficial to the kingdom of God than we've ever been before. Again, this vessel can be used for certain things. But it has its limitations. Because it hasn't been fired to the extent that that has. You couldn't put this in the oven like you can put that into the oven for long periods of time. You may can heat it up a little bit, but it would not be able to withstand because that has been. Some of you have been through some, you've been through the fire. You've been through the fire. But I'm going to tell you what, God has a certain purpose and God has a certain plan. Just like there's a purpose for this and there's a purpose for that. But if you're willing to be put through the fire, and if you're willing to go through trial, and if you're willing to go through test, you can come forth as pure gold. And you can be so much more valuable and so much more beneficial in the kingdom of God. We're going to be stopping here. There's so much, again, you know what grace is? Grace is unmerited, divine assistance given humans for the obtaining of salvation and sanctification. Let me say that again. Do we have it up there, Liv? Unmerited, that means you don't deserve it. Unmerited, you don't deserve it. Unmerited divine assistance given to humans for obtaining salvation and sanctification. First of all, it's for, saint, it's for salvation. And it's appearing to everyone. Again, they have to open up the door. It's a choice. How many of you, if you could, you'd open, the, you'd open up the door for your kids? You'd open up the door for your family? You'd open up the door for your sibling? You'd open up the door for them if you could. But you know what? The door, now I say all the time, is on the inside. They are the only ones that can open it up. You can't make them open it up. They have to choose. Choose you this day who you're going to serve. So we'll continue on. But there's so much that we want to look at when we're talking about grace. I mean, anybody got any prayer requests today? Brother Bo?